<laughs> so I know that many of you have traveled with Stephen already, but if you haven't, here he is. He's a military historian and archaeologist. He is joining us today from southern England near Portsmouth, where it is rather late in the evening. So we thank Stephen very much for taking time out of his, his night to join us today. I believe it's nine o'clock there right now, so a little late. So um, Stephen has been literally around the world, born in Singapore, has lived in Germany, Japan, has traveled extensively throughout Europe and Asia. And this definitely has uh, fueled his passion to work further as a military historian and archeologist and as a leader for Zagram Expeditions. He's been working with Zagram for several years now. And uh, you know we love to hear all about the history of the places that we go. So he is filling a very important role in doing that. Uh, he's done a ton of really cool stuff. He's actually done excavations at Stonehenge, which sounds amazing to me. He's also spent a bunch of time on the south coast of England searching for the thousands of wrecks that date back to World War I and has studied quite a few of them. He's also deeply interested in D-Day infrastructure and uh, many of the battles around Britain in World War II. He has recently published a series of articles on motor torpedo boats and motor gun boi boats, which are the Royal Navy's equivalent to American PT boats. So today, he is going to take us on a trip through time and space with uh, amphibious invasions across the ages. He's going to touch on a lot of the locations that we'll be visiting uh in 2021 on various zagram expeditions so he's going to tell you all about what you can see on those expeditions and a little more detail about the history of these assaults over the ages so i'm going to go ahead and hand it over to stephen now he's going to start sharing his screen so hopefully this is a smooth handoff and stephen you are on all right right hello everyone um, I hope you can see my screen and I hope you can hear me. If you can, can I have a thumbs up? No thumbs up. I've got some thumbs up. Excellent. Good. Well, it's very nice to see some of you again. Um, ideally, we would be on a ship and I'd be chatting to you over cocktails in the lounge, but uh, unfortunately that's not to be at the moment. But we will be travelling again, I assure you. And um, Thank you for joining me, even though it's quite late at night for me. I know it's lunchtime for you and I'm sure you're probably rather be having lunch um, but I hope you will find all of this interesting as we we go through a little journey around um, some aspects of my work and uh, also some of the places that we're going to be seeing next year because uh, as Sonia said in my my day job back here in the United Kingdom I am a, an archaeologist and a historian and my main area of expertise is somewhere that we like to call the intertidal area which is that area between low tide and high tide on the coast. And this involves looking primarily at shipwrecks, mainly in ports and harbours and estuaries on the south coast of England, as in this picture here where I was excavating a First World War German destroyer. And the interesting thing about working in the intertidal area is it tends to be quite messy. Um, so I'm very used to wading around in the mud. Uh, and this is quite appropriate really because this very much is the realm of amphibious operations and amphibious assaults especially of the first and the second world war are something that i've studied uh, academically a number of times and at the moment i'm very lucky to be employed by the national museum of the royal navy as their heritage advisor for the restoration of a landing craft tank that took part in D-Day. This is in fact the only surviving landing craft tank from the D-Day invasion. It's being restored in Portsmouth at the moment and I'm, I'm very lucky that I get to call this my, my job, my home. I'm the one who's working on it, recording the archeological changes that are being made to it and researching its history. And of course, in all of the You're trips I've it. done with Zegram, um, with many of you, we've no. been to a lot of locations that have an association with amphibious assault. Uh, two years ago, on the western coast of Europe trip, we visited the Normandy beaches, and this photograph taken from the US cemetery is looking down onto Omaha Beach, which of course, 76 years ago, probably this week, 76 years ago, this photo would have been taken looking across Omaha Beach just after Operation Neptune. 
last year in Sicily, uh, in Gela Bay, which was one of our first stops on the circumnavigation of Sicily. We, we had this view looking out onto the sea, uh, which was in 1943, the location of Operation Husky, the amphibious invasion of Sicily. And earlier last year, January, January, February last year, um, during the, the Bay of Bengal expedition. I, I took this not very good photograph as we sailed up the river to Rangoon, but this is exactly where in 1945 Operation Dracula was conducted. This is the amphibious liberation of Rangoon, which of course we then went and moored in the harbour in. And even last year when we did our circumnavigation of the British Isles, um, of wild and ancient Britain and Ireland, uh, we visited an embarkation hard at Falmouth at Trebar Gardens, and this is the, the other end of an amphibious operation. This is the place where US troops embarked on their landing craft before they crossed the English Channel for the invasion of Normandy. And as it happens, next year, all of the expeditions that I'm on, uh, Mediterranean Mosaic in April and May 2021, and then Wild Island and Scotland in May and June, uh, and then the circumnavigation of the Black Sea in July, and the Crossroads of Empires trip down to uh, Egypt and Israel in uh, like that's October, November. All of these trips have, we visit sites where there has been some sort of amphibious operation in the past. And that is because amphibious operations really are everywhere, and especially around Europe and the Mediterranean. And in fact, some of the very earliest amphibious operations can be traced back to the Mediterranean. And although we're not going to visit the specific site of the Trojan War amphibious operations, we are going to be touching on it quite a bit. And some of you will no doubt have heard of the Trojan War, or at least the Trojan Horse. Now, there is, of course, still a great amount of academic debate whether or not this was a real thing. Did the Trojan War ever actually happen or was it literally just a story that was told in Homer's Iliad. Um, the story of the Trojan horse is fairly well known but whether it was actually a, a genuine historic event is, is questionable, uh, although it probably does have some sort of historical basis. We are fortunate though that in the modern day and age uh, we have Hollywood and they don't care if it's real or not or if it's just made up because if it's something that sounds like it'll be a good film they'll make a film about it and so the film Troy um, came out with uh, of course Brad Pitt in his warrior look. Um, entertaining film, got Brad Pitt in it, uh, but historically it's probably a little bit of a turkey to be honest. But one of the things that is very interesting is the attack and the siege of the city of Troy itself. And there's a lot about this invasion that's depicted, which is, which is quite good. For a start, if the Trojan Wars did actually happen, then this is probably the first amphibious invasion in history, at least that we know about. One of the things they get wrong, though, is the type of ships that they use in this scene, because here they are using ships um, that are actually much later in the history of the Mediterranean. Um, in the Trojan War they will have used Mycenaean galleys, but archaeologically we don't have any decent records of exactly what those would have looked like. All we really have are um, documentary sources which don't give us a great amount of detail. So for the film Troy they actually used this type of ship. Uh, this is called a Byrene and it actually originates from a much earlier design of ship which then evolved in the Mediterranean through the various civilizations that uh, expanded there. And the Byrene actually really evolves from significantly earlier than the events of Troy. It probably comes from the ancient Phoenicians. Now the Phoenicians uh, were one of the earliest cultures in the Mediterranean and they originated this early type of vessel which is called a hippos, uh, which interestingly um, translates as horse in Latin and there has been some suggestion that perhaps the Trojan horse was actually a ship based on this sort of design but we won't get into that at the moment. What we're really interested in is the Phoenician uh, expansion across the Mediterranean. So the Phoenicians, like I said, were amongst the very first civilizations in the Mediterranean. And they evolved uh, in the area that we now think of as, as was essentially Israel or the Levant region in approximately 2500 BC. And 
this culture then originated from uh, Greece to the south and the, the Turkish tribes to the north. And we're actually going to be seeing some of this uh, when we visit uh, this area of the country of, of the Mediterranean rather in September sorry October and November on our um, crossroads of empires trips now there's all sorts of wonderful things to see on that trip obviously there's gonna be food and nature but we will see some of the Phoenician ruins as well as other periods of history in places like Haifa and some of it might be quite hard to discern these are genuine Phoenician ruins at the old Jaffa lion temple uh, but there is plenty to see there and we will very heavily see a lot of the, the origins of the Phoenician culture and civilization. But what was really important about the Phoenicians is that they spread very quickly around the rest of the Mediterranean and from their original roots down in uh, the far eastern part of the Mediterranean they spread quite far across the western side of the Mediterranean as well including large amounts of North Africa, uh, southern Spain or the Iberian Peninsula, Sicily and Corsica uh, between 1500 BC and 300 BC. And in fact one of the areas that they settled, primarily the North African coast, eventually evolved into its own civilization and empire as well, the Carthaginian Empire. And this is one of the biggest uh, and most important original empires in the Mediterranean. Now how the uh, Phoenicians manage this is by traveling by ship and so it's no surprise that their ships evolved quite quickly and proved themselves to be incredibly important in the origins of sea trading vessels. Now their boats were quite shallow draft but what's interesting is that the Phoenicians are probably the first people to have used a keel in their ship's hull. So they could be considered to be amongst the very first people to build what we now consider to be boats. Now you might think that in order to cross the Mediterranean from Phoenicia to Carthaginia, uh, that you would probably just go in a straight line uh, from Israel to, to modern day Tunisia. But all of the evidence we have, including archeological evidence and documentary sources, suggests that in fact, what they were doing when they made these journeys was hugging the coastline of the northern African coast. Now this was important for a number of reasons. It's so that they could beach their ships uh, when they either needed to call in for food and get provisions or to escape from the weather in the Mediterranean. Either of those are possible. But certainly they definitely had very shallow draft ships. But these evolved over time and the original bireme type of ship evolved into what's known as a trireme which is essentially a much larger bireme um, and we have a, a very good source of reference for triremes uh, one that has been built based on all of the archaeological evidence and documentary sources that gives us a very good idea of exactly how these triremes would have appeared um, and this one is in Greece, uh, it's called Olympias, it's a perfect replica, it used to sail as well. And you can work out why it's called a trireme from the oars running down the side. You have your upper layer and then a secondary layer below that and then a third layer. So three rows of oars, hence the name trireme, three decks of oars if you like. Now. These are proper seagoing ships and they are meant for open water warfare and you can see these rams that are actually protruding from the front so that they can ram other vessels and board them. But you can also see there that they have an incredibly shallow hull and that again enables them to be beached on beaches either to call in at ports to gain provisions or in the event of an attack on a hostile enemy held coast. And in the age of the trireme, after the civilizations in the Mediterranean had evolved and we'd had the Greek Empire and the Roman Empire, triremes were one of the main weapons of war between these various civilizations vying for power uh, across the seas of the Mediterranean. And that was especially true at the capital of the Carthaginian Empire at ancient Carthage. And during the Third Punic War between Rome and Carthage, Carthage, the city, was held to siege by the Roman Empire. Now, this is now Tunisia, but back in 149 to 146 BC, this was a scene of warfare. And we'll explore this in April in the um, uh, Mediterranean mosaic trip. And we will see some of the evidence of this fighting between the Roman and the Carthaginian empires. Back in 146 BC, this was a, a very large and incredibly developed city. 
and it had its own port and harbour facilities and it was held uh, to siege by the Roman Empire who wanted to defeat Carthage and overrun their civilization and absorb it into their own. Now, unfortunately, this very important battle has never actually been Hollywoodized, and so we can't visualize it as easily as we could the Battle of Troy. But in fact, it will have looked in many ways very similar to this Hollywood film with large amphibious invasions with forces landing on beaches to lay siege to the city of Carthage. When Carthage was finally defeated by the Romans in 146 BC, it was their amphibious assault outside the walls of what's called the Cophon, which is that inner harbour that you can see there. Um, the Romans were able to beach their triremes just offshore of this and then scale the walls enter the Cophon, which is still there in fact, and we will hopefully see this when we do our, our uh, Mediterranean mosaic trip. You can see it there in the middle of the photo, that's the old ancient harbour of Carthage. And once the Romans had seized that in an amphibious assault, they were able to make their way through the rest of the city, fighting their way through the town, road at a time, across the course of a week. And after they finally seized control of the city, they razed it to the ground. Um, it was rebuilt by the Romans and absorbed into their empire. And the archaeology of the Roman civilization then lies on top of the Carthaginian uh, archaeology today. And we will see all of this when we visit Tunis, because Tunis is a city that has now been built on top of Carthage. When we visit in, um, I think, uh, late April, we'll get there, uh, on our Mediterranean mosaic trip. And it's going to be absolutely fantastic to see all of this evidence of these... Um, battles that took place back uh, in 146 BC. This then was one of the, the greatest successes of the trireme as an amphibious assault vessel, but in fact its, its use spread across a much wider area because it was triremes that the Romans also used when they attacked Great Britain and their very first landing on the British coast in 40 BC when they first encountered the Iron Age tribes of Great Britain, they used triremes to land on our coast. And when they came back again 80 years later in 47 AD in their full-blown invasion, it was again using triremes to land on our coast and assault the Iron Age tribes and subdue them before they conquered most of the rest of Britain as well. But the trireme, being a very shallow draft vessel, wasn't as suited to the Atlantic Ocean and the English Channel and the North Sea as uh, as it was in the Mediterranean. And that's why in, in the areas of Northern Europe, a completely different type of vessel had evolved. And in fact, only a couple of hundred years after the Roman landing on the British coast, uh, a new vessel was built in the Baltic, far up in the, the Northern parts of Europe. Now this is uh, from approximately 300 to 350 AD, and it's called the Nidum boat. It is an excellently preserved Scandinavian vessel, and it is the first complete ancient boat to have been fully excavated. And there is an awful lot that we can learn from this vessel. It uh, is made of single 80 foot long oak planks. There are no scarf joints to join different bits of the hull together here. The timbers that run down the sides of the boat are complete for 80 foot. Uh, it is only the keel that has any scarf joints in it. This was primarily designed to be a rowing boat. Uh, there was no um, mast step to erect a mast in it. This was purely for rowing, but it was vessels like this that could cross the North Sea and enable early Anglo-Saxon explorers to reach Britain. And it was incredibly well designed as well, with riveting uh, on the hull, uh, the planks being held together with iron nails, and caulking uh, using animal hair uh, to make it watertight and prevent leaking between the individual planks. And it had aspects of seafaring that we still are very familiar with today. This is the stern of the boat, and you can see that there's this single oar running down the back. Now, this is an interesting evolution because that is on the right hand side of the boat. And from this, we get the old English word, which I can never pronounce properly, steel board. This is the steering board or the steering oar. It was always on the right hand side of the boat. And this is the one that was used to steer the boat because this predates rudders. 
And so from that old English word steel board, we have the word starboard, which of course is the starboard side of the ship. We have port for the left and starboard for the right. And it's on very early vessels like this that had this steering oar at the stern that we have that uh, maritime um, language, port and starboard. Now there's something else in that photo as well that you can see, just hanging over the side. This is actually a, a timber motif that was retrieved from the archaeological site that this boat was excavated from. And it's, uh, it's a timber, uh, what do you call it, a figurehead. And in fact, two of these were found um, along with the... Uh, when it was excavated. And if you look very closely at that face, you might get a bit of an idea of the evolution that we're seeing in vessels here. Because if you look at that and you, you give it a cursory look, then you'll probably realize that what we're seeing there is a very Nordic design. And that's because the Nydon boat is one of the very early pieces of evidence for the evolving Viking culture. Now, if you're not sure what the Vikings are, that's fine. There's a History Channel TV series all about it, uh, full of graphic violence and, and all sorts of uh, historical untruths. But not to worry, because this is quite modern, and you might be more familiar with a particular film from 1958 with Kirk Douglas and Tony Curtis and Janet Lee. And this tells us everything that we need to know about the Vikings. Uh, please observe from this trailer. Viking, there was no life except life in battle. There was no death except death in battle. There were no women except women taken in battle. There you go. Everything you need to know about the Vikings, all in one easy trailer. Uh, and the film is um, fairly hard and fast with the facts, shall we say, uh, in particular Tony Curtis's trousers uh, are somewhat um, guessed at, perhaps we could assume. But one of the things that the Vikings as a film does actually get right is the Viking ships. And that's because the ships that they rebuilt or they created for the film are based on genuine archaeological evidence. And in fact, the ships that they use in the film are based in particular on this vessel, the Gokstad ship, which was excavated in 1880 and is a, what's known as a carvey, or the smallest type of long ship that was used uh, by the Vikings. And these are incredibly well-designed vessels, and they, they have all of the important aspects of a vessel that we have recognized today, starting with a, a considerable keel, uh, which is then built up with a lower hull, and then the side hulls are built up with what we call upper strakes along the sides, and then a very important feature, which gives it strong reinforcement. All of those bits on the side, those are called the knees and they give the, the rest of the hull its incredible rigidity, which despite the fact it's quite shallow, makes it a very strong design. And so from this archaeological evidence of these various Viking boats that have been recovered, particularly from the Baltic region, we can build up, uh, sorry, we can build up very accurate models of exactly how Viking ships would have looked and operated. And in fact, we can glean so much from them that we can even start to establish the height of Vikings a thousand years ago. When they built the replica boat for the Vikings film, of course, for the film, they wanted lots of tall Scandinavian looking men to play the Vikings. They soon realized that tall men couldn't row properly on that Viking ship because the oar locks, or excuse me, the holes in the hull for the oars were so close together that it indicated that the original men who rowed that boat must have been quite short by comparison to the tall men that they got into the film. So these boats were incredibly successful in their design, and these are the boats that the Vikings used to explore uh, the world around them. We know in Britain, for example, that they came to Lindisfarne, uh, which is commonly considered to have been a raid on a, a small English monastery just off the coast of England. Um, and that has been open to debate recently, but certainly what we do have as evidence is this tablet, which certainly shows a rather aggressive stance by these visitors who have crossed the North Sea. But uh, it was in 886 AD that they started to become more permanent settlers when Vikings coming across from what we now call Denmark arrived at York, 
and sacked the town before they then started to expand to the south and then down into the area that we call Wessex today. And it was here that they started to encounter genuine defense from the, the native Saxons who were brought together under one of our first earliest kings, King Alfred. And in 886, he signed a treaty with the Vikings called the Treaty of Alfred and uh, Gunfram, which essentially gave the Vikings half of what we would now call England today. And this was an area of the country that became known as Danelaw. And the significance of that is that in the modern world, in, in England today, that, that legacy of the Viking presence is very obvious in archaeology and place names. And every one of these yellow dots is an indication of a Viking presence, either in a place name uh, of a settlement or in archaeological finds that have been made there. You can see that huge cluster of them around the territory that they used to occupy, Danelaw. But you can also see it in other places as well, including Shetney and the Orkney Islands, uh, and particularly around the coast of Ireland. Because in fact, when the Vikings were exploring across mainland Britain, um, shortly before that, in fact, they had started to explore Ireland as well. Uh, their earliest raids in approximately 795 AD. But in 841, much as with Britain, uh, the main island, they decided to come to stay. Uh, and they started to arrive at several settlements on the coast, in particular Dublin, which of course now is the capital of Ireland. In 841, they arrived off the coast and landed, uh, establishing themselves and conquering local tribes. And this painting uh, is um, actually on display in the town hall at Dublin and shows Irish tribes gathering together to try and oppose the landing of the Viking fleets. Uh, but in that, they were somewhat unsuccessful because the Vikings did land in Dublin, much as they do on a, a frequent basis with repl replica ships that sail across the North Sea and sail into Ireland uh, every couple of years and recreations of this event. And it wasn't just Dublin, they sailed along the south coast of Ireland as well. And, and last year, we visited Waterford and we'll be visiting there again next year on our um, Irish uh, excursion, um, it's, uh, the Wild Island trip. This is Waterford, uh, and some of you may recognize Amanda Charland, one of the historians uh, down in the bottom left. And this is in what's known as the Viking Triangle. And this is a replica of one of the small Viking vessels that would have plied around the coast of Southern Ireland a thousand years ago. And in fact, the Vikings established themselves in places like Dublin, Wexford, Waterford, Cork, where we'll be visiting as well, and Limerick. And these all became quite established Viking locations. And it really was their vessels, again, being very shallow draft that enabled them to get right into our coast, right up onto the shore and then attack the local tribes' homesteads. And it wasn't just shallow beaches. They did it as well. They did it in the Skellies. Uh, and we visited previously, and again next year on the, the Wild Island trip, we'll be visiting Skellig Michael. And Skellig Michael, of course, is incredibly uh, well known for its very rich array of, of wildlife and bird life in particular. But of course, Skellig Michael also has other aspects to it, and that is its human and built environment. And it was the Vikings who actually raided this huge rock off the coast and forced the local monks to withdraw inland and head back to mainland Ireland because the Vikings were attacking them so often. And indeed, we'll be visiting Balin uh, next year on the Wild Island trip where they then established their new abbey uh, away from the marauding Vikings. Now, Balin Skelligs, this is the remains of the abbey itself. There is, of course, a, a castle there as well, which some of you may have seen if you were with us last year. Um, this is not an, an anti-Viking castle, I should point out. It's actually 15th century, uh, sorry, 16th century. It's from the 1500s. Um, but we'll stay with the Vikings just a little bit longer because some of the other things that they got up to would have an incredible, important impact on other places that we're visiting. Around the same time as they're exploring Britain, they also started to explore mainland Europe and they settled on the North French coast. Now, this was under the leadership of uh, a Viking lord called Rollo. And he may have looked a bit like this. This statue in Rouen depicts him. 
Uh, or if you're a fan of the Vikings TV series, then he may have looked a bit like this, played by Clive Standen. Uh, you can take your pick as to which one you prefer. I will not judge. Um, but very soon, the Vikings have established an agreement with some of the local French uh, lords in that area. And in 911 AD, the Treaty of Saint Clair gave them uh, a large area of land on the north coast, including the Channel Islands, which of course we now know as Normandy. Now, this is where things get complicated in English history because um, after this treaty had been agreed, uh, the descendants of Rollo, in fact, on the left, the great, great, great grandson of Rollo, William, became Duke of Normandy. And he was the first cousin of Edward the Confessor, the King of England. And allegedly, Edward the Confessor had promised the throne of England to William uh, on when he died. But uh, then King Harold, the, uh, the next in line to the throne, claimed it for himself when Edward the Confessor died. And William, deciding that he wanted what was rightfully his, decided to invade Britain. And in 1066, he sailed across the English Channel to Pevensey Bay to invade. And the reason I mention this is because this is one of the first documented amphibious operations from Northern Europe where we actually have imagery from around the time. And of course, it's not photographs, uh, but what we do have is the Bayer Tapestry. And I know some of you were with me on the Western coast of Europe trip last year and we saw this and it's a, an amazing piece of history made some time after the actual landings, a couple of years. And we do have to remember it is a propaganda piece, but it does reveal to us an awful lot about the use of these boats that had originated with the Vikings. And in the Bayer Tapestry, we see them being pulled up onto the shore and the men uh, disembarking from them with horses before heading inland to Hastings, where they would engage the English force. This then is one of the, the first true images or illustrations, if you like, that we have from an amphibious assault on an enemy held shore. And of course, this was followed almost immediately by the Battle of Hastings, where King Harold was killed. Still not 100% sure which one he is. Is he the one in the middle with the arrow in his eye or is he the one on the right being stampeded by a horse? We'll never know. But uh, we do know that Harold was killed and William took the throne on Christmas Day in 1066 and claimed England. But this wasn't the only direction that the Vikings were going in. They were also heading to the east and their, their explorations didn't just take them across seas, it also took them down in particular the major rivers of what we now call modern Russia. Uh, and they used the Volga to head down into the Caspian Sea. And then they used another network of rivers in what's called the, I always mispronounce this, the Varangians uh, to the Greeks trade route. And the Varangians was the name that was given to people from the Mediterranean area to the Vikings. Uh, and so th this trade route evolved the name of the Varangians to the Greeks trade route. And this exploration by the Vikings down these rivers and into the Black Sea, of course, opened up the Black Sea for them to then head down to other countries, Turkey and Greece, in their explorations. And in particular, of course, it led them to Constantinople. Now, Constantinople, even in the Viking era, was a significant city and a major trade port uh, and an incredibly flourishing city. Of course, it's now called Istanbul. It was changed from Constantinople in 1930, um, but it was first built uh, as the about 500 AD, um, so the sixth century. And we know that the Vikings were there because uh, like all good explorers, they left their mark. They literally graffitied that temple I just showed you with their names. And it's, it's not quite certain exactly what this says. All that has been distinguished from it is the name Halvdan. Uh, it might say something on the lines of Halvdan was here. Uh, and in fact, the Vikings became uh, an elite guard for the local king of Constantinople um, and, and were there for several uh, decades and in fact remained in the, the Black Sea area for some time until the Viking uh, Empire as it was started to retract and they, they started to move back to the north. 
Uh, that was around the 1100s when Viking power was starting to wane. And so they departed the Black Sea and, and left Constantinople to what's known as the Byzantine Empire. This is the post-Roman Empire that took over and evolved from the Roman Empire after the fall of Rome a thousand years ago. Now, the Byzantines might very well have wished that the Vikings had stayed because, in fact, only a hundred years after they left, in 1204, Constantinople was actually sacked and almost completely destroyed, uh, as this 19th century French Romantic painting uh, demonstrates. Now, how that came about is an interesting story in itself, uh, because this was part of what's known as the Crusades. Now, some of you will hopefully have heard of the Crusades. Um, the Crusades then were this religious war uh, across Europe. It wasn't just limited to Jerusalem uh, for several hundred years. And there were a number of Crusades to try and establish Christianity and a Christian kingdom, particularly in the Jerusalem area, but to rule out other religions across most of mainland Europe. The first Crusade was back in 1096 and lasted for three years. Uh, and was an attempt to establish this Christian kingdom uh, in the area of modern day Israel. And Constantinople, which we'll be visiting on the, the Black Sea circumnavigation in June, July next year, was actually an important uh, marshalling point on these journeys down towards the Holy Land of Jerusalem. And people came from all over Europe, Britain, France, Germany and Italy and gathered at Constantinople before they headed down to the Holy Land to wage war against the Muslims and establish this Christian kingdom. And in uh, 1099 they laid siege to Jerusalem uh, and having captured the city they then slaughtered almost everyone in it and established the first Christian kingdom in the Holy Land. It wasn't long after that, in fact, uh, 50 years, that they then went on a second crusade to expand the Christian empire in the Israel area. And the second crusade of 1147 to 1150 um, succeeded, but it wasn't the success that everyone had hoped it would be. And in fact, it led to uh, a rather fraught future for the Christian kingdom. And it wasn't long before the great Muslim king Saladin, or Saladin, laid siege to Jerusalem in 1187 uh, and kicked out the Christians, defeating their early kingdom. Now this, if you are Hollywood affectionados, is actually the subject of another Hollywood film, Kingdom of Heaven with Orlando Bloom. I actually recommend this film if you're interested in the Crusades because although it, it, it's broadly historically accurate, it does play hard and fast with a, a bit of the, the historical facts, but it will give you a very good sense of what the Crusades were like, the technology that they had, the lifestyle that was lived. So it's quite an entertaining film. Um, and it's probably quite good watching if you're going on the, the uh, Crossroads of Empire expedition next year in, in October, November, this is probably quite a good film to warm up with. Um, but where this film finishes off is just before the start of the Third Crusade. And the Third Crusade uh, was led pretty much by one of England's most famous kings, King Richard I or Richard the Lionheart. And if you're not familiar with Richard the Lionheart, that's all right. Hollywood has solved that for you as well. He is, of course, Sean Connery. And if you've ever seen Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, he appears at the end of the film to marry Robin and Marion. So just think of Sean Connery and you've got him, King Richard the Lionheart. This is what he may have looked like. And he probably wasn't quite the successful king that everyone likes to make out. But he did lead Britain uh, on the Third Crusade. And this crusade again used Constantinople as a gathering point, but they also sailed across the Mediterranean to try and better the uh, Christian kingdom in the Holy Land. They didn't succeed though, and although they claimed a victory, really all that was left was a series of quarrelling between the various kingdoms that had attempted to establish this Christian kingdom in Jerusalem, uh, and the scene was very much set for just 10 years later, the Fourth Crusade. And the Fourth Crusade is the important one because everything changed at this point. Previously, the wars had been against other religions, principally the Muslims, and previously they had traveled across land. But this time, the Crusaders decided to gather at Venice. Uh, but then, because of a series of political infighting and um, 
dis disagreements between the various kingdoms. Rather than attempting to attack Jerusalem, they decided that instead they would attack the Byzantine Empire and they would attack Constantinople. And so they sailed their ships up past Greece and over to Constantinople or, or Istanbul as it is now, which of course involved having to make their way up the Bosphorus River to lay siege to the city. Now this is where history can take a back seat again because this all happened at the turn of the century, 1203 AD. And again, we're very lucky with Hollywood, aren't we? Because they again give us this really good idea of what amphibious assaults were like in this age. Because we have a 2010 film of Russell Crowe, Robin Hood. And this film is what they call the untold story. And that untold story is really relevant for amphibious operations because it's all about the completely made up 1199 invasion of Britain by the French. Now, if you look at that scene, which is from the film, you really get this sense of a sort of D-Day like invasion, don't you? And, and that's because they really did use landing craft in this film. Uh, and that really does look like one, doesn't it? And as it comes up onto the beach, its bow ramp drops down and men charge off of it. And if you think that looks a little bit reminiscent of the Second World War, well, yes, it really does. And that's because they literally used metal barges, uh, which had to be signed off by the, the Maritime and Coast Guard Association so that they could be put to sea um, and then were dressed up to make it look as if they were slightly medieval. Now, there is a little bit of historical evidence for this. Now, what actually happened uh, at exactly the same time as this film is supposed to be set in the siege of Constantinople, we know that um, the siege ended with Constantinople's surrender and the Crusaders were able to enter the city. They then appointed their own favored king. But as soon as they left, the Byzantine Empire then overthrew this king, toppled him and then appointed their own. So the following year in 1204, the Crusaders came back for a second siege. And this time they weren't going to mess around. And on a particular day, I think it was April uh, in 1204, when they had good winds behind their ships, they sailed across the Bosphorus and rammed their vessels up onto the shore immediately below the castle walls to attack the city uh, and then leapt out of their vessels and assaulted the city, looting and pillaging it for three whole days. Now what's very interesting about the written accounts from this amphibious attack though is the description that was given. Now those two paintings I just showed you are French romantic paintings from only about 200 years ago. This one uh, dates from uh, probably around the 15th century and is probably a lot more accurate. But what we do have a written account of this amphibious operation, I'm just going to read you some passages. Uh, Robert of Clary, his account of the invasion, goes to say that, um, bear with me, uh, when the fleet came to land, forth came the knights out of the transports, all mounted, for the transports were built in such a fashion that they had doors which were easily opened and a bridge was thrust out whereby the knights could come forth to land, all mounted. And the second account, oops, sorry, gone too far. The second account by, um, what was his name? Geoffrey de Villehardun, uh, his memoirs and chronicle of the Fourth Crusade and the conquest of Constantinople said that the mariners opened the ports of the transports and let down the bridges and take out the horses and the knights began to mount and they began to marshal the division of the host in due order. What these accounts are saying is that they actually had vessels that had been specially designed to allow horses to disembark almost instantaneously. So these weren't regular ships that were used for going to sea. These were specially prepared craft that had been designed with the object of being able to get men out of them men and horses, in fact, incredibly quickly when they hit an enemy beach. Now, we don't know exactly what they look like, but from the illustrations of the time, such as this one, we do get the sense of specially built vessels that were being used especially for landings on enemy beaches, for genuine amphibious assault. But just to clarify, 
this is Hollywood and this is not anything like what they might have looked like. This is this is complete fantasy. But we do get this sense that a thousand, I'm sorry, 800 years ago, they were starting to build the first what we could call amphibious assault vessels. But one of the other things that the Crusades ushered in uh, was a brand new form of, of technology for waging war. Uh, and this illustration from 1326 is one of the very earliest illustrations of a cannon or a firearm. And firepower of this magnitude was going to change the way in which countries and civilizations across the world would wage wars forever. And it was firepower like this that caused a completely different evolution in the types of ships that were used by the world's powers um, and essentially led to the introduction of the galleon. And it was large warships like this that evolved across the centuries into what we now call the man of war, ships like HMS Victory that some of you may have seen in Portsmouth. And amphibious attacks became very different in their nature and it became more commonplace for fleets to subdue a land-based power by simply staying offshore and bombarding them into submission. Now that wasn't always the case though and sometimes there did need to be genuine amphibious assaults and there, there was a small little uh, disagreement somewhere uh, in North America, which I believe is called the American War of Independence between 1775 and 1783. Um, now, it's very easy to think that that was mainly or purely fought in the North Americas, but in fact, this was a conflict that spread even further around the world and as far away as Gibraltar on the southern coast of Spain. Now, Gibraltar had been a British or English territory for centuries before this, uh, but during the American War of Independence, the French and the Spanish both took this opportunity to try and attack British possessions in other parts of their empire and remove the British from southern Spain altogether. And between 1779 and 1783, they laid siege to the city of Gibraltar, uh, having fleets offshore and laying batteries along the, the south coast to try and subdue the British by bombardment, um, which didn't work because the British were able to tunnel deep into the rock of Gibraltar and establish defensive batteries that couldn't be destroyed by bombardment from the sea or by the land. And in fact, we're visiting Gibraltar on the Mediterranean mosaic trip and you'll be able to see the fantastic and very famous rock of Gibraltar, which of course is famous for many things, including its wildlife, uh, its very well-known Gibraltar apes, um, and I can tell you they're everywhere. But the other thing that is everywhere, and you will see an awful lot of, is the layers of defences that have been built across the entire rock. Um, Gibraltar is synonymous with defences against amphibious assault. And because the British were able to build such hard and uh, well-concealed defences, the Spanish and the French saw that the only way that they would be able to defeat the British in Gibraltar was through an amphibious attack. And one of the ways in which they decided to do that was to build specially prepared bombardment vessels, which you can see here in this French diagram. Now, these were not seagoing ships. These were designed for one purpose. They were to float offshore and bombard the British held coast. And they were strengthened on one side. You can see it on that middle plan so that they could completely resist British bombardment whilst firing their cannons at the British positions as well. And then under cover from these bombardment ships, Spanish ships would slip in very close to the coast and use these telescopic ladder devices so that they could climb over the walls of the Gibraltar fortress and assault the garrison there. So this amphibious invasion, sorry, as it was planned in 1782, became known as the Grand Assault. Um, but it proved the dangers of amphibious assault because it was essentially a complete disaster. Uh, British gun positions were able to destroy the uh, floating batteries, the bombardment ships, while they were still offshore. And here you can see in this um, unknown 18th century artist's painting of it, one of the bombardment ships is detonating, causing carnage amongst the invading fleet. Uh, and the Spanish then were left in the water and had to withdraw with a huge loss of life. 
And one of the interesting things is that actually at Gibraltar, more Spanish and French troops were committed to the battle uh, than had ever served in the North Americas at one time. So this defeat at Gibraltar was a complete disaster for the French and the Spanish. And that is how the British actually won the American War of Independence. I'll let you debate that with me in the lounge on the ship one day. But these amphibious assaults, um, because the war, of, sorry, because maritime technology had shifted to the galleon, it meant that amphibious assaults, that the vessels that had started to develop 800 years before never really developed into suitable warships. And so we see the risk, the other risk for amphibious invasion. Um, in a landing at Bantry Bay by the French in 1796. And this is literally two bays down from the Balanskelligs Bay, which we'll be visiting in, in May next year on the Wild Island trip. Bantry Bay is a small bay off the Irish coast. And the idea was the French were going to land there and try and rouse up the Irish in revolt against the British in 1796. But this is one of the real dangers of amphibious warfare, the weather. And the entire fleet was almost completely destroyed by a massive storm before any of them could get ashore. And in fact, the only thing that did come ashore during this attempted invasion by the French was a solitary boat, uh, which is now known as a Bantry Bay boat. It was a um, officer's barge from one of the French frigates, and it remained in Bantry Bay for some time. Uh, before it was eventually taken to Dublin Military Museum, where it remains today. Now, interestingly, the lines were taken off of this boat and it uh, was then recreated uh, with a number of reproduction vessels of exactly the same design. And it shows the difficulties of an amphibious assault during the age of sail because these are not easy boats to handle. Although they could take a, a sail, uh, they were primarily meant to be rowed. And they would be rowed by the infantry that were then going to assault the, the, the garrison on land. And they are very heavy, hard to work boats. And I know this because I used to row one of them. And in fact, in 2012, myself, along with um, nine crewmates and, and two other boats of the same design, we actually rowed 18 miles down the River Thames for the Queen's Diamond Jubilee pageant. And I can tell you that rowing one of these boats is a completely energy sapping activity. It will exhaust you. And the thought of then having to disembark from this boat and engage in terrestrial warfare, assaulting an enemy uh, held position, doesn't even bear thinking about because um, it was a completely exhausting activity. It was well worth it. I very much enjoyed it. It was a fantastic event to be part of. But these boats, which were the only sort of vessel available for amphibious assault at the time, really weren't cut out for warfare. And in fact, it would be another hundred years before navies would start to experiment with what could be called, again, genuine amphibious assault boats. And in 1904, on the English coast of the place called Clacton on Sea, members of the public who were watching Royal Navy manoeuvres will have seen their first hints of this new type of vessel. And you can see it in the background just there. Uh, because that little boat in the background is one of what could be described one of the world's first true landing craft. Unlike that Robin Hood Hollywood nonsense, this is a genuine vessel uh, with a, a forward ramp so it can come right into the shore and disgorge men or cargo straight onto the beach. And in fact, as you look at them, they instantly have the appearance of a genuine landing craft. Only 10 years later, the German Navy were using a very similar design of boat in the Baltic uh, during Operation Albion when they seized several Russian held islands. Um, but perhaps one of the most famous amphibious operations from the First World War is Gallipoli in 1915 when the British tried to seize the uh, sea route through the Gallipoli Peninsula, again, to attack and seize Constantinople and knock Turkey out of the war. Now, in the initial phases of this assault, they did use traditional rowing boats to make their landings, but these have quickly proven themselves to be inadequate for such a form of mechanized warfare with machine guns and howitzers pounding them as they came into the shore. Now, 
a lot of the evolution of, of landing craft as we know them had something to do with that man on the left who some of you might recognize that is a very young Winston Churchill and on his right is Jackie Fisher no relation he was the first sea lord of the Royal Navy during the early 20th century and it was these two men who put together the initial proposals for one of the world's first true landing craft and they were to be called X lighters the simple idea being that they would be powered by a motor they would have a very large cargo hold and they would have a ramp at the front so they could arrive on a beach drop the ramp and troops could swarm ashore now that plan isn't very easy to, to interpret i realize that so here is a, a more modern rendition of them a computer model that gives you an idea these are essentially floating barges with ramps at the front so they could be used to land troops directly on the beach and you can get an idea of exactly how that would have worked from this film this isn't gallipoli uh, this is a staged depiction of a later invasion in 1925 uh, an event called the Rift war on the north coast of africa but you get an idea as to how these landing craft would have worked literally these vessels come right into the shore the ramps drop down and the men charge off as i said this is staged but it is a depiction of the riff war which is a very short and small war localized to the north coast of africa uh, when french uh, france and spain tried to uh, eradicate uh, slavery on the north coast of Africa and it was essentially an invasion at a place and I can never pronounce this Al, Al Hakumas, uh, which isn't far from uh, Tangier where we're visiting on the Mediterranean mosaic trip in 1925. Now this would be a completely insignificant war forgotten to history if it wasn't for one very significant fact this is probably the very first use of well, so the very first amphibious landing of tanks it's the first time that tanks were deposited from landing craft onto an enemy held beach that was 1925 but very soon almost everyone was at it in 1926 the royal navy starts its first trials of tank landing craft uh, which could take a single armored vessel and deposit it on a beach and over the coming years they would develop a, a succession of small landing craft which would be in place by the outbreak of the Second World War. With the arrival of the United States into the war, an ever-growing number of landing craft of all sorts of different types started to become available from these very small landing craft personnel to these huge landing ship tanks with their own bow doors and two decks which would come into a beach, open the bow doors and then drop the ramp onto the sea, uh, sorry, onto the shore. But perhaps the most significant type of landing craft to have evolved during the Second World War is the landing craft tank. This then was designed to carry several tanks onto an enemy held beach and disembark them rapidly for an immediate frontal assault on enemy held positions. And they went through several evolutions to ever larger vessels that could carry up to 10 tanks. Once the United States came into the war, they could literally be built on a production line. And what you see here are uh, Mark V landing craft actually on a production line. The one in the foreground, uh, they just assembled the hull. A crane would then move that back where the bows and the, um, the stern section and the bridge would be assembled. And then it would be craned back into the next position for the sides to be erected. And when it was complete, it was at the very end of this production line when the crane would then launch it into the water. Between them, Britain and the United States built uh, over 3,000 landing craft tank, 1,155 in the UK and 1,988 in the United States. Um, and these were the most predominant type of landing craft at Normandy. So more than 3,000 of them built. It's a bit of a surprising that, to the best of our knowledge, there are only three left in existence today. Now, one of those is in Haifa in Israel, and we're going to see lots of incredible things in, uh, in Haifa on the crossroads of the Empire's expedition, um, obviously ruins and, and rich culture, but I will try and persuade Mike Messick to let us drive past this so you can have a look at it. Um, the other 
land and craft. Uh, well, you have that in the United States. This is Lake Superior, and this is LCT 205, Second World War veteran, which is based at Bayfield on Lake Superior. And the third of those landing craft tank that still survives today, well, I've got that one. I'm very lucky because that's the landing craft that I work on here in the United Kingdom. And it looks like a terrible pile of rust in this picture, I know, but this is what it looked like last week. It's had a paint job, the scaffolding is coming down, and that will very soon be on display, I hope, outside the museum in Portsmouth. Now, the very first time these were used in combat, was at Dieppe in 1942, but that was a bit of a disastrous operation. And the Canadians in particular lost a large number of men and the Royal Navy lost a lot of landing craft. But these vessels would then prove themselves to be worthwhile in the first large scale amphibious assault of the Second World War, which was carried out in the summer of 1942. So to give you a little bit of background as to how the war had evolved in the Mediterranean in the, in the uh, 1940s, um, in early 1942, this was the situation. Germany and Italy, of course, hold all of mainland Europe, and Germany has managed to push the British back as far as Egypt in North Africa. Uh, but thanks to this gentleman, uh, General Montgomery, at the very famous battle of uh, El Alamein in October 1942, he was able to reverse the German advances and German forces were pushed out of Egypt and all the way back to the Tunisian border. The next necessary move to remove the Germans from North Africa would be to take them from the left hand side as well, to get them from behind, uh, but that would involve landing uh, on the North African coast and this was held by the French, but they weren't allied with us. This was Vichy France that had signed a treaty with Germany. And so this would be a very difficult operation with a, a nation that we really wanted to be on our side but were technically opposed to us. So the solution was um, to make our passage through the Straits of Gibraltar and attack North Africa at the same time trying to prevent the French from resisting our landing. Because we didn't have any bases in the Mediterranean that could sustain an attack of this size, it was going to be necessary for our fleets to sail directly from Britain and from the United States uh, down to the Straits of Gibraltar to make their landings. And this is where those huge landing ship tanks came in useful because they had the capacity to cross these vast ocean spaces. And in fact, the men who crossed from the United States then landed directly on enemy held beaches. The idea was there would be three simultaneous landings on the 8th of November 1942 at Morocco, at Oran, which we'll be visiting on the Mediterranean Mosaic trip, and at Algiers, which we'll also be visiting. But because of this tense diplomatic situation, in particular the French didn't like the British at this point in the war, it was decided that this would become a almost completely American operation to the extent that the British troops would almost be disguised as Americans. And in fact, Royal Navy destroyers flew the Stars and Stripes and the RAF, Royal Air Force aircraft, were given US stars on their planes to make this look like a complete uh, US-led operation in the hope that that would win the French over. But what was significant about this operation, which was codenamed Operation Torch, was the level of logistical planning that went into an amphibious operation. Rather than the uh, hastily attempted landings of the past, this one was fully organised and planned with detailed convoy routes, full landing schedules, a timetable of the vessels that would land and exactly how they would arrive, these ones are actually from Normandy. These are documents that I use for my research, but they give you an idea of the, the scale of planning that would go into an amphibious operation. You don't need to read them. This is just an illustration, but you get an idea of how much they were planning these operations, that they were even drawing plans of where individual ships should be at specific times to make sure that the landings went fully to plan. And all of the vessels were given uh, a, assigned loads to make sure that they were carrying exactly the right troops so that those men could be deposited on the beach in the right order at the right place at the right time. Operation Torch was the first time that a, an amphibious assault on this scale was planned to this level. 
and it was hugely successful. When the landings were made in November 1942, led by the Americans, and you can see the stars and stripes on the left of that picture, the French very quickly capitulated and joined the Americans in resisting Nazi rule. And the Americans were able to advance in land, capture their objectives, and it wasn't long before we were then able to press the Germans from the east and the west and by the spring of 1943, uh, all of the Germans had retreated from North Africa. One of the things that Operation Torch did reveal, though, was the need for uh, specialist vessels to support landings of this type. And this is where we get this very strange, eclectic array of different types of vessels. This is a landing craft flak. So it's a modified landing craft covered with assault guns for engaging low flying aircraft or firing support onto the beaches. Perhaps one of the most famous is the landing craft rocket, which is another modified landing craft with the tank deck, normally used for tanks, covered in missiles, which can be launched very close inshore to the beach, uh, raining a huge amount of explosives down on enemy positions just before our landing craft arrived. These then went on to see service across the Mediterranean and of course at Normandy. And these vessels were put to the test in Sicily in Operation Husky in July 1943 and very quickly that island was captured as well. Uh, but later on as the Allies moved up the coast of Italy at Salerno in Operation Avalanche they also gained experience and learnt about the need to establish quick resupply of a beachhead so that those forces were strong enough to advance across the countryside that they had, uh, they had just reached in their beach assault. Uh, and then in January 1944, Operation Shingle, the landings at Anzio in an attempt to secure Rome. Although this operation didn't go as planned, it showed Allied planners the necessity of advancing out of a beachhead as quickly as possible before the enemy had the opportunity to build up their forces and counter that landing. And all of these lessons from the Mediterranean were vital to the planning and the success of Operation Neptune, the D-Day landings in Normandy. If it wasn't for the operations in the Mediterranean and the experience that was gained from them, then D-Day would never have been the success it was. Now, I've only touched on a few amphibious operations, really, and from the Second World War, of course, I haven't mentioned the Pacific at all. But of course, you have that very famous island hopping campaign of amphibious assaults on the island chains of the Pacific, the Western Pacific in particular, uh, throughout 1943, 1944, and 1945. The difference of those being that this was an ocean war, whereas in the Mediterranean, you were capturing continents of your amphibious assaults. And also I'm running out of time, so I need to skip through a few slides. Um, after the war then, a lot of these amphibious assault craft, of those 3,000 landing craft tanks that were built, most were sold off and scrapped. And the Royal Navy kept a very small cadre of them, but they forgot to keep any crew who were trained in how to operate them. And this meant that in 1956, during um, what was known as the Suez Crisis, uh, at the Suez Canal down in Egypt, um, we didn't actually have enough crew to man the landing craft that we had and there had to be a very, very quick training regime to instruct people on how to properly operate landing craft all over again. Now Suez is the canal that connects the Mediterranean with the Gulf of Suez and the Red Sea to the south. It's an incredibly important trading route um, through the Egyptian coast and it separates Africa from Europe uh, or Asia. Um, and we'll be visiting this on the crossroads of the Empire trip. Indeed, we'll be sailing down it, which will be absolutely fantastic to sail down this um, fantastic marvel of engineering that took 10 years to build uh, between 1859 and 1869. Unlike most canals, it has no locks. The waters run freely through it from the Mediterranean to the Red Sea. And it was built by a private company, most of the shareholders of that being British and French. Um, but in 1956, uh, because of political problems in the, the Middle East, um, the Egyptians, under their uh, president, uh, Nasser, Gamal Nasser, decided to nationalise it. So they took a privately owned 
uh, enterprise, which was largely owned, of course, by British and French, and brought it under national control. This did not go down well with the French and the British. And so they uh, were then even more alarmed when only a few months later, there was another disturbing development just next to the Suez Canal. The Sinai Peninsula was invaded by Israel and they drove right up to the gates of the Suez Canal. Britain and France quickly said, well, this is very dangerous and we as peacekeepers should go in to restore order to this important trade route. And so in uh, November 1956, they bombarded the town um, of, uh, I forget the town's name, but the, the settlement at the, the mouth of the Suez Canal. And then they made uh, an assault primarily by paratroopers on the 5th of November, and then an amphibious assault on the 6th of November. The Egyptians, though, very cannily blocked the canal and made it useless for trade. Uh, and in fact, most of the amphibious craft that the Royal Navy had employed during the war were then employed in trying to clear the canal as salvage vessels. But the reason that the Suez intervention came unstuck is that Britain and France were left politically isolated uh, as no other nation was willing to pledge support. And it later came uh, to be discovered that our Prime Minister, Anthony Eden, had orchestrated the Suez Crisis with his French counterpart, uh, Borges Manoir, the um, French Minister of National Defence, and the Israeli government, uh, Shimon Peres, the Director of Defence for Israel. These three people had orchestrated this crisis. Um, to have the Israelis attack the Sinai Peninsula so that the French and British could step in as peacemakers. And once this was done, um, Anthony Eden was forced to resign. We were forced to withdraw from the Suez crisis. And what's incredibly significant about Suez is that marks the end of Britain as a world power. But there was one little thing that happened in the Suez crisis, which would change amphibious operations forever. And it was this the helicopter. For the first time, helicopters were used in an amphibious assault on enemy territory, and they have been ever since. And in fact, when the United States intervened in Grenada in Operation Urgent Fury in 1983, they also used helicopters to land troops on the beaches. And any of you who are going on the um, uh, the West African Coast Expedition in February, I think, next year. You'll be visiting a place called Sierra Leone, which um, Britain intervened in in 2000. And again, they used exactly the same tactic. An amphibious assault was instead led by helicopters. The reason being that helicopters are far faster than boats. They can get down to the beach and then they can secure it for larger ships to come in much later. The helicopter and its arrival post-war, especially in the 1950s, has changed amphibious assaults forever. And so we've come a very long way from those very early beach boats that were built by the ancient Phoenicians almost 4,000 years ago. But of course, amphibious assault boats aren't always about war. Um, and any of you who have been to St Kilda before, which we'll be seeing on our Wild Scotland trip, You'll be surprised to know that, in fact, it was landing craft that supplied St Kilda for many decades, primarily to support the military base, but also to transport civilians to the settlement there. And landing craft do still call in at St Kilda even today. And of course, in Zegram, we have our own amphibious vessels as well, the humble Zodiac very similar in design to these amphibious boats I've been talking about with a very shallow bottom. They can go across open water, um, but they can go onto land and we can use them for our own distinct type of amphibious activity, which is a lot more fun than invading another country. And I think that these really are the amphibious assault boats of the future, but we use them for a completely different purpose, to explore and to visit these places and learn more about them. So the history is the history, and I hope to be able to tell you all about the history of these places on these coming expeditions, but let us hope that it remains as history, and these amphibious assault vessels are used by people like us, rather than soldiers and sailors. So I shall leave you with that thought, and I do hope that over the coming year, I will see you in the Mediterranean, either on the, the Mediterranean mosaic trip or 
uh, the wild Ireland and Scotland trip, um, crossroads of empire when we visit Israel, or when we visit the Black Sea and we visit places like Insta in sorry, Istanbul, formerly Constantinople that you see here. And I've definitely overrun there and I do apologize, but I do hope you've enjoyed that. Thank you very much. <laughs>